Okay, today we're going to talk about the parts of the cell and we're going to start with a discussion of the parts of the cell that are wrapped up in membranes. Membranes are very important in the cell function and we're going to talk about where we find them and what they do for the cell. So first of all, continue to think about the cells as a system. Cells are a very complex system, like many systems that you're familiar with. They have many parts that work together to perform a particular function. So what function are cells doing? Well, in the broad picture, they are living. They are all about trying to continue to live. So in order to continue to live, they're going to have to definitely take in nutrients so that they can have building blocks to make new parts. They are going to have to take in energy so there is a way to fuel all the different processes that they participate in. Uh, ultimately, they'll have to reproduce so they can continue with their own kind. And of course, there's going to be a certain amount of gas exchange that has to happen as well. So all of these processes, plus a few more, are going to be occurring um, with the help of all the different parts that are occurring in the cell system. So what about all these membranes? Membranes are wrapped around lots and lots of parts in many cells. Uh, all cells are wrap, wrapped in a big membrane, but why, why are they important? Well, those membranes are definitely going to be functioning as a barrier. So when you think about what a barrier is, a barrier is a block. It's a separation. It's a way to say something is on one side and something different is on the other. So what is the membrane of the cell? Uh, a barrier between, well, if we're thinking about the cell membrane specifically, we're talking about a barrier between the outside environment of the cell and the inside environment of the cell. Now, some parts are wrapped up in membranes and they lie within the cell. So those membranes are going to have other functions in terms of what they are barriers between. So how does this barrier uh, get put together? Well, it's pretty important. And what's interesting is all of the membranes that we have in our cells that occur in our body, the trillions of cells we have in our body, they all have this basic structure in common. So this structure is a um, what we call a bilipid layer. So this part of the structure here is uh, consists of fatty acids, this white and black part here. And this part of the structure is going to be consisting of a phosphate molecule that, and they're all connected together to form this um, phospholipid molecule. These molecules then line up in a big old row um, due to attractions between them. And what's interesting is if we just had that single layer, the outside of the cell is watery and the inside of the cell is watery. So this phosphate part of this um, molecule wouldn't really kind of know where to be attracted to because the phosphate is polar so it is attracted to water molecules whereas the lipid part of the molecule these fatty acids are nonpolar so they are trying to repel or get away from the water molecules so what works out really great is to have two layers so what ends up happening is the phosphates of one of the layers are attracted to the outside watery environment whereas the phosphates of the other layer attracted to the inside watery environment. The, that leaves the tails, these um, fatty acid tails, to be attracted to each other and that creates a uh, lipid barrier that is going to really help separate the cell from its environment. So things have to get through. It's great to have the separation from your environments, otherwise you'd just be a puddle of soup, which is not really good for life functions. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to have some structures that are going to allow things to go through. And proteins are going to provide um, the structure for those passageways that are going to pass through this bilipid layer. Um, if we look a little closer at these proteins, what we see is that these proteins, many of them have uh, are shaped so that there's tunnels that are going to allow substances to pass through. Um, some of them have very unique shapes that are allowing certain types of atoms and molecules through. For example, in this image there shows um, a particular protein that allows sodium and another um, protein that is going to allow potassium 
in this instance uh, to participate in something we call the sodium potassium pump. Um, we'll get into that a little later. So what uh, organelles in the cell have membranes? Here's a list. So if you think about it, yes, the whole cell is wrapped in a membrane, but within the cell we see many parts that are wrapped in their own special membranes or even made of membranes. So the nucleus is going to be genetic material that is wrapped in a membrane. The mitochondria actually has two membranes. So there's going to be an outside membrane and then there's going to be an inside membrane that is kind of all folded up inside of, inside of that outer, outer layer. Um, vacuoles, which are just storage sacs, they are also wrapped in membranes. Golgi bodies, which are going to work along with the endoplasm of reticulum, they are made of membranes. Chloroplasts are also double-walled. They have an outer membrane, and then within the chloroplasts, there's these little sacs that are also made up of membrane material. And then, of course, we have lysosomes, which are um, little small sacs that contain uh, enzymes, and those are also wrapped in membranes. So, bacteria. They don't have any of these organelles. The bacteria are known as prokaryotes, and one of the characteristics of prokaryotes is they do not have membrane-bound organelles. And what that means is all of these organelles do not exist in bacteria. They do have an outer membrane that wraps around their entire cell, which is quite smaller than uh, eukaryotic cells, which is what our cells would be. But they do not have these individually wrapped functional areas. That doesn't mean to say they don't have the functions that these um, parts do. For example, although the bacteria does not have a nuclear membrane to wrap its DNA, it does have DNA. And it does have to go through the processes that usually occur in the nucleus um, of a eukaryotic cell. And uh, there are bacteria that do photosynthesis. And they don't have chloroplasts to do that, but they still manage to um, take care of the photosynthesis and those chemicals that are going to be participating are going to be located free in the cytoplasm or attached to the cell membrane actually. So if you look at the structure of a bacteria, you can see that the genetic material forms um, a region, but this this area that is shown in this picture is not wrapped up in a membrane. It's just loose genetic material. Uh, you don't see any of the other kinds of structures we normally see in a picture of a cell. It does still have ribosomes, but ribosomes are not wrapped in membranes, so that is why they would um, not be shown here. So, um, all cells we know have a cell membrane. You have to have a cell membrane to be a cell because that is your separation from your environment. So even the smallest cell of those bacterial cells, they are wrapped up in a membrane. The job, the overall function of the cell membrane is to really allow substances into the cell that need to come in and allow substances out of the cell that need to come out and not allow things out or in that shouldn't be leaving or entering. But how do we get these things through? That is the question, and that is the function of the cell membrane. So there are three ways to get substances through a membrane. We can have simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, or active transport. We're going to talk about each of these three, three things. So diffusion. Generally, we know that diffusion is just a process that occurs all the time. We see it happening around us, or we probably smell it happening around us. If somebody sprays perfume in the room, you're going to smell that perfume even if you're standing on the other side of the room because those perfume molecules will be pushed around by the motion of the air molecules and eventually those perfume molecules are going to be pushed in your direction just randomly, but they'll get there eventually and when they hit your nose, you're going to be able to smell them. So how do those move? Well, they're going to move because they are pushed by the random molecular motion of the air molecules. That is what diffusion is. Substances are going to flow from where there's a greater concentration, like where you sprayed that perfume, to where there's a lesser concentration, where the perfume didn't exist, until they're more evenly distributed, or what we call equilibrium. That doesn't mean the molecules will stop moving. It just means that they're more evenly distributed in a given area. So they will continue to move, and so some of those perfume molecules that are on one side of the room will 
move back to the other side of the room eventually, but they'll kind of trade places and, and stay at this kind of equilibrium state. So diffusion occurs in the air, it occurs in other fluids, and it certainly occurs in all of the different fluids, um, both in and out of the cell. So keep in mind that concentration is a number per unit of space. So if we think about um, so perhaps putting a cell in a glass of salty water. So the water that is in the cell, because it's at a higher concentration than what's out of the cell, the water will want to leave that cell and kind of try to water down that salty water that you place that cell in. <coughs> Excuse me. So what does happen is that water will move from where there's a greater concentration to a lesser concentration. Now, if you put that in a smaller amount of water, that's not going to change the movement if you leave the concentration the same. So we don't think about sort of how much water is there, but we think about what is the concentration of that water um, as opposed to the solutes that are dissolved in the water. So if you put a cell in a salty ocean that's not designed to be in the salty ocean, then the water is going to leave that cell trying to water down the ocean. Maybe some of the salt will take come from the ocean and go into the cell as it tries to reach equilibrium, but the end result for that cell is not going to be a good one because it's not designed to be in that environment, and it will eventually dehydrate and die, which is not good for the cell. So another place where we've thought about uh, concentration is when we are testing for dissolved oxygen. We will use units like parts per million or milligrams per liter. So this is also an expression of how concentrated something is. Notice that it's a certain amount in a given volume. So you've got, you've got a comparison of one as compared to another, um, molecularly speaking. So diffusion. Simple diffusion occurs across the membrane. So just like that perfume going across the room, if we put some sort of sheer drape in between and the molecules were small enough to go through the material, the fabric that you had set up, the perfume would still pass across the room. And that's kind of how it works in the cell membrane. So substances will pass from where there's a higher concentration outside the cell to where there's a lower concentration inside the cell or vice versa. If you have something in high concentration inside the cell, it will pass out of the cell to where there's a lower concentration. Now this will occur naturally and it will occur differently depending whether or not that substance is soluble in fat because as we've already discussed, the cell membrane is primarily made up of these fat molecules that provide a, a, an oily barrier to getting in or out of the cell. So if you cannot dissolve into a fat fatty layer, you're not going to be able to get through the cell membrane, unless, of course, you find a passageway through one of those channel proteins. So fat-soluble molecules are going to be able to pass right through that plasma membrane by diffusion. Plasma membrane is just another word for the cell membrane. Um, or um, molecules that are polar are going to be able to pass through the channel proteins. Facilitated diffusion is just a term to refer to the help that carrier proteins can give to help move substances a little more quickly across that membrane, but in the direction they were going anyway. So facilitated diffusion doesn't use any extra energy. It's just helping the molecules move more way for substances to move across the membrane is going to require some energy. Now in cells, energy is stored in a molecule called ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine triphosphate is going to transfer its energy uh, to molecules that need energy to do some particular function. In the case of active transport, what will happen is the protein molecules that help move a substance across the membrane may need to access the energy because it needs to move a substance against the way that substance normally would flow. In this image here, what we see is we see on the outside of the cell, there is a lot of these hydrogen ions. On the inside of the cell, there is a lower concentration of higher hydrogen ions. So that's great. So the natural flow would be those hydrogens would want to come in but that's not what the cell wants. The cell needs those hydrogens to go out. Um, so this 
purple image represents a protein that is going to pump those hydrogens against the gradient, against the concentration gradient, um, for a particular purpose. And in order to do that, it's going to need ATP. So this is referred to as active transport. This is a process we will see happen in chloroplasts, and we will see it happen in, in mitochondria as well. It's a very common process. Active transport can also happen in larger quantities. When a uh, cell moves a larger amount or a larger molecule into or out of the cell, we refer to that as exocytosis or endocytosis. The cell membrane will actually wrap around a larger molecule or a larger organism that is trying to take in. So for example, white blood cells use this when it is when they engulf a bacteria and they're trying to bring it in because ultimately they're going to digest it and kill it. That would be a process of endocytosis. So two uh, processes that are shown on this screen are pinocytosis and phagocytosis. Just two specific kinds of endocytosis. Pinocytosis refers to the process where cells bring in kind of a little larger amount of water than would naturally flow across carrier uh, proteins. Uh, phagocytosis is when a cell actually engulfs a larger cell, I mean a, a larger object like a bacterial cell or a larger molecule, and brings it into the cell. What will happen is that substance will come into the cell. It will now be in a vacuole and that vacuole will fuse with a, a lysosome, which is carrying digestive enzymes. And then what's going to happen there is that material is being digested, and now that bacteria is all gone, and those nutrients will be partly absorbed if they're useful, and they'll be expelled if they are not useful. All right, to help you understand these processes a little bit better, let's take a little uh, look at some active animation provided by Prentice Hall of the active transport processes we've talked about. First, we're going to take a look at the processes of endocytosis. Endocytosis, uh, like phagocytosis and pinocytosis, are the process of taking in substances through the membrane by actually engulfing or wrapping those um, molecules or substances uh, in membrane. So what we're going to do is we're going to give this cell, the cell is set up with uh, images that represent the bilipid layer here and the proteins that are embedded in the bilipid layer. Endocytosis is not going to involve the proteins directly. What's going to happen is we're going to take a food particle here and we're going to put it outside the cell and this cell is going to need to eat this food particle and it's too large to pass through the protein channels so it's going to engulf it. So I'm going to drop it and we're going to watch this cell go through the process of phagocytosis to take this molecule into the cell. That uh, uh, vacuole that is now full of food is going to be available for the cell then to process through digestion and absorb the molecules that result into the uh, cytoplasm and where they will be sent to wherever they need to be. Uh, let's take a look at another similar process, exocytosis, where a cell needs to expel a certain quantity of molecules. In this case, we're going to look at the opposite process of phagocytosis, where in this case we're going to have the cell expel some water molecules. Now, water will diffuse through the membrane easily through many of the protein channels. However, sometimes the cell needs to get rid of a larger quantity of water, in which case it may expel a whole sort of bubble of water, a whole vesicle full of water out to the outside. So we're going to give this cell some extra water on the inside that it needs to get rid of. And we're going to watch that cell get rid of extra water molecules through the process of exocytosis. And the last process I want to show you is the process where we have uh, molecules that are able to pass through the protein channels. In this case, these are molecules that need to be pumped against the natural flow or the natural gradient of diffusion. So we're going to take sodium ions, and they are located inside of the cell here, and they are also located outside the cell. But the gradient, the natural flow um, for the sodium ions to flow would be from the direction of outside the cell to inside the cell.
but instead this cell wants to pump the sodium out. So we're going to add the sodium to activate this animation and we're going to watch this cell pump that sodium against the grain against the gradient using energy. Notice it also is going to be pumping sodium in the opposite direction using those protein channels. This is referred to as the sodium potassium pump and the cells use it for particular functions in the body. This animation is available at phschool.com if you would like to go to it yourself and manipulate some of the different uh, icons and processes for yourself. We're going to take a moment and we're going to look at a YouTube video and this video is going to give you a good idea of how we actually do this. You know, does this happen in you? Absolutely. All the time. So we're going to take a look at the inside of your intestinal tract and see how this transport process is occurring there. We get all our energy and organic molecules from food. Before we can use the molecules we eat, they have to enter our cells, starting with the cells lining the small intestine. Let's zoom in to the surface of a cell. The plasma membrane is selectively permeable. Some molecules can move across it, while others cannot. How do materials enter and leave cells? Lipids, such as these yellow molecules, can dissolve in the lipid bilayer. Notice how they move down their concentration gradient, from where they are more concentrated to where they are less concentrated. This is an example of diffusion. Diffusion is a form of passive transport. It does not require energy from the cell. Most molecules can't cross the lipid bilayer. Here, the sugar fructose moves into intestinal cells by facilitated diffusion, moving down its concentration gradient through a transport protein. Facilitated diffusion doesn't require energy from the cell, so it's also a form of passive transport. Water crosses the plasma membrane by facilitated diffusion, or by diffusing across the lipid bilayer directly. The diffusion of water across a membrane is called osmosis. The sodium-potassium pump moves ions against their concentration gradient, from where they are less concentrated to where they are more concentrated. This requires energy from the cell and is known as active transport. Energy from ATP is used to move sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions in. Another type of active transport is co-transport. Here, both sodium ions and glucose move into the cell through a co-transporter protein. Sodium ions move down the concentration gradient created by the sodium-potassium pump and glucose moves against its concentration gradient. Now let's move to the other side of our intestinal cell. Materials can be exported in vesicles that fuse with the plasma membrane and release their contents outside the cell. This process is called exocytosis. In endocytosis, the plasma membrane pinches in, forming a vesicle that contains material from outside the cell. On this side of the cell, we can also see oxygen and carbon dioxide diffusing across the lipid bilayer. Cells use all these processes to get what we need. Okay, let's review the key subjects that we've covered today. First, we talked about the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryotes, bacteria, are organisms that do not have membrane-bound organelles. Eukaryotes, like plants and animal cells, do have organelles such as the nucleus and the mitochondria and chloroplasts and other organelles like that that are wrapped in membranes. All cells, whether they be prokaryotic cells or eukaryotic cells, will have a cell membrane. 
That cell membrane is a membrane that is selectively permeable, which means that it's going to control what goes in and out of the cell. Not all things will pass. One of the ways that substances pass through a cell membrane is through a process called passive transport. Passive transport occurs just due to the natural diffusion of molecules. Molecules will diffuse from where there's a greater concentration to where there's a lesser concentration just due to the natural molecular motion. Passive transport is sometimes assisted uh, through, because of the proteins that are embedded in the cell membrane. Active transport requires a little bit more help. Not only do you need a protein that is going to help a substance across the membrane, but you're also going to need to supply that protein with energy to do this job. Because in active transport, what we're asking is that that protein pump a substance against the concentration gradient, which means against the natural flow. So you're asking that protein to pump something from where there is a lesser concentration towards where there's a greater concentration, which is not the way it naturally flows. So we need to add energy. It's kind of like rolling a ball uphill. You need to add energy to that process. So through these processes of active and passive transport, molecules are going to pass through the cell as needed in order for the cell to get what it needs to do all of the functions that it needs to maintain its life.